Hi, Patreon subscribers. Welcome and thanks for your support. Many of you voted to have me address sympathy and empathy from an evolutionary perspective. I think it's an excellent choice. The topic is one of my favorites, and it couldn't possibly be more important at this moment in history. I'm not going to attempt to define these terms etymologically, to say how they came into usage and what they have meant in the past. My purpose here is to define them for maximum value. For that to be achieved, the two have to be defined precisely such that they interact in a way to cover the territory to maximum effect. Let's talk a bit about adaptive evolution. We all tend to think of evolution as about the past, and indeed there's good reason for that. But adaptive evolution occurs because it prepares creatures to deal with future environments. The past cannot be changed. The future is where one's profits can be enhanced and one's costs can be reduced. And so that's what evolution is about. When we think about sympathy and empathy, it would be good for us to think about them in that context. Let's start with empathy. Human beings are very special creatures. Far beyond any other creature that has existed, we are programmed by experiences that we have after we are born. One result of that is that one human being and another may differ to a great degree, and this means that uh, the range of behavior may be quite wide. At the same time, we are very highly social creatures, which means that our success as human beings is largely dictated by how well we interface with others of our kind. So in order to do that well, it is very valuable to be able to predict what other people are going to think, what they will feel, and ultimately what they are going to do in response to changes in their circumstances. Empathy is the very special evolved tool that we use to figure out what other people are going to do in response to changes in their circumstance. So if I'm to talk about empathizing with you, in order to empathize with you, I run the data of your circumstance through my mind to see how I would feel if I was in your shoes. If our minds are similar because we've had similar developmental histories, then I may be very effective at this. If our minds are very different because we've had very different developmental trajectories, then I may have nothing more than a crude sketch. It's still probably better than nothing, but it's not going to be nearly as good as if you and I have shared a great deal of history. The value of my empathy with you, however, does not depend on whether or not we're on the same team. It is important to understand one's enemies if one is to defeat them, just as it is important to understand one's allies if one is to aid them. Empathy does not pay any heed to whether or not the person that you are empathizing with is your enemy or your ally. Now, I've spoken so far as if empathy is a general capacity, that two people have something like a coefficient that dictates how well they can empathize with each other, and in general, that's probably true. There are certainly going to be places, though, where two people can empathize to a great degree, but then fail in some particular zone. For example, I grew up in Los Angeles in the 1970s and 80s. If I meet somebody else who grew up under similar circumstances in the same place, I may have a lot of insight into how they're going to see the world. But if that person is female, there may be some set of circumstances or events that I understand less well because they don't mirror my own experience. The same can be said for generational differences. If I meet another biologist, I may understand a lot about how they see the world, but if that biologist uh, is a baby boomer, then they grew up in boom times and, and I did not, and that may affect the way we understand each other. It is also possible to bootstrap empathy uh, where one does not share developmental circumstances with somebody else. Extensive contact between two people who are dissimilar can result in coming to understand how the other person sees the world. This may also be why human beings are obsessed with narratives. We love movies and novels in large measure because they run us through circumstances that we will never face so that we can understand how characters in those circumstances see the world. And if we ever run up against somebody who has had a similar experience, we may know a great deal more about it than we would otherwise. Scientific study can also reveal such things. Behavioral scientists in the last several decades have come to understand that Contrary to most of our expectation, human beings often value a particular opportunity not in absolute terms, how good is the opportunity, but in relative terms, how good is that opportunity relative to what other people have. 
knowing that allows us to correct for one of our expectations. All right, now let's talk about sympathy. Sympathy, I will argue, is empathy plus alignment. Now this fits the etymology. Sympathy, same pathos. And what this means is that if I empathize with somebody so that I know the way in which they're likely to view a particular circumstance, and I also am in alignment with them, that is to say they are on my team, then my emotional experience at their plight is liable to be parallel to their emotional experience. So it makes intuitive sense. If I'm watching a film of an enemy of mine and they are struggling to answer questions from a hostile member of the press, well, then I can appreciate that they are feeling terror and maybe embarrassment. But my emotional experience of watching them suffer through these things may be one of relief or even pleasure. You know, the German term schadenfreude comes to mind, meaning pleasure that one takes at somebody else's misfortune. Now, if I'm watching a friend of mine face the same circumstance, well, then I am liable to feel their terror and embarrassment right along with them. That would be sympathy. Now some final thoughts. Many things involve important kinds of empathy and sympathy that we don't typically associate with those terms. When musicians get together to play music, they have to understand what each other are going to do in order to interface in an effective way. If they're playing in front of an audience, they also have to figure out how the audience is going to hear what's being played in order to be maximally effective. The same can be said for a humorist. Um, or an animator. And lastly, educators face the situation. It is not enough to simply deliver correct content and imagine that the audience is going to understand it. One has to know how the audience is going to hear what is being said so that they can come to a new understanding of something they didn't see before. I hope this has been useful. I look forward to seeing your comments and I also look forward to the next video.